um, first, I, I I just want to acknowledge the fact that I I look uh, much older in person than on this picture, but thankfully I dressed it exactly the same way so you could recognize me. And um, so for those of you that have read the, the short description of today's presentation, um, ice cream, baby shampoo, and mRNA vaccines uh, all contain a polymer, which is called uh, PEG, and it's... Uh, in um, different, uh, under different forms in all of these ingredients. And in our lab, we're interested in finding out how PEG can engage the immune system and eventually understand a little bit more about the pharmacology of nanomedicines um, by stu studying this uh, excipient. So PEG is a very interesting polymer um, and it's used in you know a lot of different products that we use every day. Um, so this is for different reasons. So PEG is a synthetic, uh, organic polymer. It is extremely soluble in water. So this is something we like a lot. And it's also very, uh, very soluble in uh, organic solvent. So which really makes the chemistry of, of you know, to, to, to um, synthesize their different derivatives uh, much simpler. So, uh, you know, it exists under uh, surfactants like polysorbate 80 that you, that you know, and uh, as you know, under different forms where you have, you know, always these repeating structures and repeating units. Um, so polysorbate uh, 80 is a, uh, is a food ingredient that is approved by Health Canada and that you can have in, uh, in ice cream. And when you eat a portion of ice cream, you uh, eat approximately, well, hundreds of milligrams of um, polysorbate. But also when you use different medication, when you go to the pharmacy, you will also have uh, PEG in various uh, pharmaceutical uh, products, uh, including you know, solutions, lotions, and creams that you would put on your skin. Um, you would also take it as, you know, as part of uh, in tablets or in, in solid uh, oral dosage forms, um, because you know, since the polymer is so soluble, it really uh, is, you know, highly soluble in water, so it, it you know, it facilitates the, the solution. And in nanomedicines, as most of you know, all of you know, um, you know, we like PEG for multiple reasons because there's there's ways. So it's the polymer can be used to change a little bit the pharmacokinetics, the immunogenicity of some drugs, and in in general um, to change the pharmacology of different drugs. So this comes from the you know pioneer work of of uh, Enmin's own uh, Terry Allen that that she published in, in the nineteen. 90s. Um, and so there, I put two papers here that are very interesting and that I keep, you know, suggesting it to to my students so they, they can read where, you know, everything comes from. So when now we're used to buy DSP PEG, you know, from Sigma or Aldrich, but in that paper, she uh, uh, Terry describes how she synthesized it and eventually used it to for, to to prepare liposomes that were long circulating so that could remain in the bloodstream after intravenous injection much longer than the formulations that are uh, non-pegulated. So this is something that we know. In this other paper, which is also very interesting, um, so not only does uh, Terry show that, that you know, the uh, pegulation increases the circulation times, but what I think is the most interesting in that paper is the fact that it really does change how the liposomes engage the immune system, or not, not necessarily immune system, but at least the biological system. On the top figure here, and, and apologize, I apologize for putting some colors on these figures, but it's, I think it would just uh, have been a bit easier to understand. You can see that as you increase the dose of non-pegulated liposomes, you very strongly change their pharmacokinetics and the amount that remain in the blood. And uh, what Terry showed is that when you do the same thing and you increase the dose of pegulated liposomes over a range of almost a hundredfold, um, you almost see no changes in the pharmacokinetics. So for us, this is interesting because that means in a certain way that the engagement, so the, that these, these two nanoparticles, because one contains PEG and the other one doesn't, they have very different and distinct ways of engaging the biological system. Years after, uh, you know, as as all of you know, uh, we also, I mean, so this, you know, we also know that that PEG is also very useful to help us uh, manufacture those those um, mRNA uh, nanoparticles, lipid nanoparticles that we use for vaccination. And I think that uh, what what uh, Jay Kulkarni uh, shows here in that paper with with uh, Peter Cullis is that um, when you use this 
pegylated lipid, it helps the self-assembly of those LNPs and it helps them stabilize. Um, and as, as some of you know, PEG needs to be shed off in order for the mRNA nanoparticles to uh, to deliver their payload and interact with the cells. But then even, you know, a lot, you know, a um, few years after, PEG is still used very commonly. So again, PEG is, is an interesting uh, excipient. But uh, you know, from the from the early two thousand, we we you know researchers started to uh, realize that when you inject peg in some in some animal models and you and you inject it multiple times, in some circumstances, it also uh, can raise an immune response that is um, tr um, targeted against the polymer itself. And so I think that the, the the first people to show, or among the first people to show it, they showed it using um, the technetium uh, labeled liposomes, and they showed that you know when you on day zero, the first dose that the 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 animals received, the liposomes behaved in a certain way, and then seven days later, the animals had sort of developed a uh, immune response to it, and that you know that really changed the pharmacology. Later, the group of Ishida from Japan, they, they showed that, you know, uh, you have a increase in blood clearance of the liposomes in a, in a few days that follow the injection of, of empty liposomes. And this increase, this accelerated blood clearance, as they called it, ABC phenomena, um, is basically due to uh, IgM that recognize the PEG uh, component of these liposomes. So these are the first evidence of anti-PEG antibodies that were produced in animals. With the uh, vaccination campaign of the mRNA vaccines, uh, some people uh, got interested also in, in, in you know, monitoring whether vaccination with mRNA vaccines also co caused increases in the uh, concentration of anti-PEG anti antibodies in patients. And so there, these are two different studies, but I think there's two, at least two other ones that are, so one was conducted in Australia and, and it's on a relatively small number of patients. And, and here they show that, um, you know, both Pfizer's vaccines and Moderna's vaccines increase the amount of antibodies, but also the number of people that have detectable levels of antibodies that can recognize PEG. In this, in this study, which was uh, uh, conducted in healthcare workers, and it, it was conducted in the U.S., um, it's a sm much smaller study, but but they also saw that uh, Moderna's uh, technology seemed to be a bit more immunogenic than uh, Pfizer's technology, and they could, uh, you know, that vaccination with with these uh, technologies could could increase the amount of anti-PEG antibodies. So this is a topic of interest for us for a, a long time, but also has some clinical consideration. So um, anti-PEG antibodies are, you know, have been recognized to recognize, to cross-react with other pegylated drugs. So for us that, you know, for us, and I guess most of the community that, that is developing nanomedicine that do contain PEG, it is interesting and we need to figure out if, you know, once a patient has developed some anti-PEG antibodies, what are the uh, odds that that these antibodies would cross react with another drug that they would receive that would also contain PEG? In this clinical trial, so this this was a clinical trial that got um, stopped in phase three because uh, some patient that had anti PEG antibodies developed some severe uh, coagulation problems, uh, allergic reactions, and 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 uh, issues when they use this drug. So this drug is a uh, you know, never reach commercialization, but this is also some, something that you can see with, with some drugs that are commercialized and used in the treatment of, of pediatric leukemia. Um, so anti-PEG antibodies, they do exist in, in humans even before vaccination, we, they were reported. So there are, there are a bunch of papers that report that, you know, depending on the type of paper, you know, one quarter of the population all the way to almost three quarters of the population have detectable levels of either IgM or IgGs that recognize PEG. So this is, you know, so so it's interesting to, fig to figure out how come that's that's happening. And, and also in very rare cases, um, some people develop allergic reactions that seem to be mediated by Ig uh, dependent mechanisms and that do recognize the polymer. So these are, are uh, skin 
strict tests that to test the allergy. And so you can look in that into that into that paper if you're interested. And what's very interesting is that you know the the patient strong very strongly react to um uh, to small injections of peg uh, in the skin. And in other contexts, when when you when you you know look at different antigen, they don't react. So so this is this seems to be an evidence that they have you know a very strong response that reacts towards some some peg. And if you read that paper, what's interesting is that the response seems also to be sensitive to the molecular weight of the peg. And um, peg being a polymer, it exists in multiple form, multiple molecular weights, and and some you know some patient tend to uh, react to very high molecular weights and others to very low molecular weights. So it's intriguing in the way that, that this uh, it works. So in our lab, we are interested in understanding two different aspects of the anti-PEG immune response. So the first, and I think probably of more relevance to the uh, uh, use of PEG as an excipient in many pharmaceuticals is what are the consequences of anti-PEG antibodies on the pharmacology of nanomedicines, but also on other PEG-containing uh, drugs? And and I think that unfortunately, this is I mean this is still an ongoing. I mean, it's unfortunate, but also it's a good that I still have a, a job as a researcher. But um, but I think that the uh, you know we don't have all the answers yet as to you know what are the consequences. We know that they exist. And my own belief, we get maybe we'll maybe we'll get to that in the questions. But my own belief is that it's probably not a very strong effect that it has. But you know, I think we still need to figure out in what circumstances do these antibodies matter, right? And and the second thing that is also of interest to us is how do you drive this anti anti peg immune response? And the and the reason why this is interesting is because as I mentioned before, peg is a synthetic polymer. So being synthetic. It cannot engage. I mean, so it's a, yeah, it's synthetic, but it's also a non-amino uh, acid-containing antigen, right? So due to these characteristics, it cannot use the same process as most antigens um, in order to raise an immune response. And we'll get into that a little bit. So we want to to understand the mechanisms that are behind this uh, anti-PEG immune response. So how do we look into it uh, in our lab? So, so there's basically like our approach is relatively simple. We're interested in using lipid containing nanoparticles or polymer containing uh, nanoparticle systems, right? And what, what we do is we label them so we can track the different excipients that they contain. So we use radioactivity that we like a lot because it's quantitative. And then we also use fluorescence that, that is also compatible with uh, flow cytometry experiments, and that enables us to see where these nanoparticles uh, end up. And um, so we have various ways of labeling the different systems that, that are of interest to us. And then we do two things with animals. So either we compare two different materials and see you know, how things happen. So this is true for the, this PEG question that we're trying to answer in our lab, but also to you know with respect to other uh, questions that are of interest to us. And another approach that we have is in in this so in in this type of approach we compare two materials in you know like in mice that are very similar and we, and we look at the prop the physical chemical properties of the material if that if they are important for um, you know the pharmacology of the drug and in this type of experiment we inject the same material but in two different mice that have different characteristics so for example one mouse can be a normal animal just a wild type black six mouse, for example. And the other one has one biological function that was, you know, a shutdown either by pharmacology or, um, you know, using a, a transgenic model. So one example, you, you shut down one type of immune function and you look at, is this biological function really important to, you know, the uh, pharmacology that we see? So these are, you know, roughly the two types of study that we do in our lab. And we use that study to look at um, the immune uh, immunogenicity of PEG on polymer nanoparticles. So these are PLGA PEG uh, nanoparticles. And we compared the immunogenicity of these nanoparticles uh, with respect to and compared it to uh, the free polymer on its own, like an, e an equivalent dose of free polymer. 
In order to do that, we did a very simple uh, ELISA assay where we have PEG, which is tethered at the, at the bottom of an ELISA plate, and we quantified using a secondary anti-IgM antibody in that case, which is conjugated to a reporter. So what do we see in that? What we see is that when you inject PEG and when it's tethered on the surface of the nanoparticle, it is much more immunogenic than when you inject equivalent doses of PEG. And I think that in a certain way, it makes sense because you know the architecture and the structure of the, the nanoparticle allows all the PEG to travel or most of the PEG to travel in the same way and to engage the immune system in a very distinct way that the, the, the free polymer cannot do. Right, so this is uh, this is uh, uh, results obtained in uh, bulb sea mice. The type of of antibodies that are secreted in that way are mostly IgM of, of the IgM isotype. So IgM is the first re immune response that that uh, mammals uh, raise when they're exposed to a pathogen. It's not very surprising because the you know the range of time that that was of interest in that in that study was relatively short. So uh, we didn't see much of these uh, IgGs that that some other people have observed that can recognize the peg. Um, next, it was interesting to you know to make sure that the uh, the antibodies that were raised against peg also had a neutralizing effect that they could raise the ABC, the accelerated blood clearance effect that I was talking about earlier. And this is exactly what we see. Basically, when we sensitize a mouse one week prior with nanoparticles and we re-inject a version of this nanoparticle that is radio-labeled after a week, then we can see that the uh, clearance or the amount that remains in the blood after some time is much lower in animals that have seen nanoparticles compared to animals that just were injected with PBS one, one week prior. The reason why the clearance is increased is uh, due to, because of these antibodies, what, what these anti-PEG uh, IgMs, they can recognize the nanoparticle and can they, they can increase the uh, complement activation. So the complement system is a part of the innate immune system, and we'll get back to, to it a bit later. But, but the notion is that here, when you compare what happens in vitro, when you take the blood of a naive mice or a sensitized mice, a mice that has uh, some anti-PEG IgM, you can see that the nanoparticles, they uh, are much more uh, able to drive a uh, the uh, the secretion of the, I mean, the activation of the complement cascade. The other thing that it does is that it, the, these nanoparticles, they also change the type of protein that absorb on the surface of the nanoparticles. And this is important because uh, the protein corona is is uh, you know is thought to be a driver of the pharmacology of nanoparticles, and we can see from this study that there are some distinct changes. So, for example, we can see differences in the type of immunoglobulins that that uh, bind to the nanoparticles. We can see that there is a bit more of IgM on the surface of the nanoparticles. So, IgM are increased. Um, the J chain, which is part of the IgM, is also increased. Um, and in contrast, some of the uh, the uh, light chains, uh, some of the the Ig light chains are are decreased. So there is a change in the type of of uh, antibodies. But with respect to complement activation, what was more striking was that there is an increase in the amount of protein that are associated with the complement cascade. And then there's a decrease of the different inhibitors that are also known to inhibit or to uh, you know, balance the activation of the complement system. So in other, in, in, in um, other words, what that means is that you know the same material has a very different protein corona if you uh, you know incubate it in the serum of some types of of, of animals that never has seen have seen um, uh, nanoparticles, or if you incubate it in the in the serum of uh, nanoparticles that uh, of of mice that have uh, seen nanoparticles were exposed to nanoparticles and have um, anti peg IgM. When we look at the at the mechanism or the the in vivo mechanisms of of uh, of these uh, anti peg IgM, what we what we uh, did is is we did, did two things. We compared what happened in mice that had a full complement system, and in mice that did not have a the ability to um, 
raise a the complement activation. And what you see, so in naive mice, these two mice, they have re relatively similar circulation times for these nanoparticles. So you don't see uh, much of a difference in the pharmacokinetics of the nanoparticles in, in animals that do not have IgM, uh, whether they are able to activate the complement or they're unable to activate the complement. In other instances, we also showed that. So that, that was shown before. That was not very surprising for us. But what was very interesting was that if you look, and this is the red, the red plot here, when you look at what happens in animals that have IgMs, um, if you remove their ability to uh, activate the complement, you can... Uh, mitigate uh, part of the accelerated blood clearance that you observed uh, when the animals have the complement. So in other way, in other words, what that means is that because they have anti-peg IgM, these animals, the clearance of the of these these nanoparticles is now more dependent on the complement than it was before the animals uh, had uh, before you know when the animals did not have uh, anti-peg IgM. So in conclusion for this for this uh, section, basically uh, anti-peg antibodies, they do change the way that nanoparticles engage the immune system. Uh, they increase the amount of complement activation that one type of nanoparticle does. So when there are some nano, when there are some anti-peg antibodies, there is a, a complement dependent immune response. And this complement uh, dependent immune response is also important on the pharma for the pharmacology of the nanoparticle and it also changes how these nanoparticles are cleared from the bloodstream so uh, for us there was there was a, a very interesting this was published at the uh, by Philippe uh, Grenier who, uh, whose picture I showed earlier and uh, who graduated from his PhD last year so next focusing on the mechanism so so we, with mRNA vaccines, we know relatively well how they can drive a anti-spike immune response, so a response that is protective against the uh, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, uh, so, sorry, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. So the idea is that they produce this protein. This protein is then uh, presented on the surface of uh, of the cells that have produced this protein, and they can engage the immune system through immunological synapses that uh, you know, involve a antigen presenting cell and a T cell. And these two cells by forming this, this synapse, by engaging various different um, uh, immune mediators, they can eventually uh, produce uh, antibodies and, and also uh, cytotoxic T cells. So this is for the, the antiviral uh, immune response, which is, which is you know, relatively well known and understood because most vaccines behave in the same way. What mRNA vaccine do differently is the way that the body is exposed to this foreign protein. But when we think about how these uh, mRNA vaccines can drive an immune response uh, directed against PEG, this is where there are more lingering questions. Um, so the data suggests, so data obtained in animal models suggests that this immune response would be independent of uh, T cells. And the reason for that is because this synapse that I talked about earlier requires the presentation of peptidic sequences, right? Very short peptides that can pre be presented in the synapse and, uh, you know, can allow the antigen presenting cells to talk to those uh, T cells, so to speak. And PEG is not a peptide, and PEG cannot be degraded into peptides because it doesn't contain peptides. So therefore, uh, the mechanisms are very different. And so we know that antigens that are that are uh, multivalent, like nanoparticles, can en engage B cells directly. And we're looking at you know secondary mediators, uh, po possibly on the surface of the nanoparticles, that can also provide a signal to B cells and tell them, you know, listen, you've been your receptor has been crosslink. Now it's time to engage and produce the immune response. So um, this notion that is of interest to us is to like the. So we're trying to understand really what type of protein can engage these receptors and eventually drive the B cells to produce an immune response that is specific towards PEG. So most of what we know about T independent antigens relies on the uh, the work that has been done. So. A lot of what we know, not most, but a lot of what we know has been done on these 
on this type of antigen. So in these type of antigens, you have a hapten, so a very small molecule that is conjugated to a large polysaccharide. And so the hapten is the nitrophenyl moiety that is here, right? And, and you have it on the surface of this bead or gel that, that I, that I you know, I rep I represent here in blue. And in fact, you have, so this NP, which is not nanoparticles, but it, it's nitrophenyl. So this hapten moiety here is presented on the surface of these small beads. But these beads are very small, right? Much smaller than the nanoparticles that are of interest to us. And also the hapten itself is a small molecule, right? It's a very, it's a, a aromatic molecule with, you know, the, uh, the, this nitrophenyl groups. And so it is very, very different from the hydrophobic core that we have in the lipid nanoparticles or the PLG nanoparticles and that have a hapten, which is here in that case, polymeric, right? Which, which, which spans a much larger um, volume of hydration. So this is why for us, you know, additional work is required to try to reconcile the mechanisms that were deciphered for these uh, type of of, uh, of molecules and to see if, if these are the same that are involved in the immune response that is directed against spec. So complement is a, is a, at the forefront of, of the research that I'll be talking today. And the complement system is a quite complex cascade, which can be triggered in three different uh, activation ways. Uh, and, and But the bottom line of this complicated uh, graph is that when you activate complement, you have some effects. And some effects can, can involve the production of, of uh, uh, chemiotaxins or um, you know, some cell uh, interactions. And the other aspect that you need to uh, understand or rem rem uh, remember from this slide is the fact that all three activation pathways, they converge, they all converge to uh, uh, the C3 uh, protein, which is this protein at the center of all activation cascades and it, and it is involved in downstream uh, effects. So uh, this is a schematic, which is much more simple and it's, which, uh, which basically represents what I just said. And we, uh, we, uh, developed or at least optimized the model in our lab where we're able to shut down this cascade by the use of a uh, co the cobra venom factor. So it's a protein isolated from the venom of the cobra. And what it does, it basically removes all C3 in circulation in the animals. And due to this removal of the C3, the animals are not able to activate complement anymore. And we use that model as a inducible model for complement depletion in uh, in various uh, animals, so we used it in mice here in that paper, and in, in in rats here in that in that other paper. So what we saw when we depleted the complement using this cobra venom factor in in mice, what we saw is that if you do that before the injection of the nanoparticles, you're able to shut down most of the anti peg immune response that is raised in those animals when you inject them with with blank nanoparticles afterwards. And the reason why this happens is that the removal of the complement cascade changes how the nanoparticle distribute in the spleen in these animals. So by removing complement, you decrease the amount of nanoparticles that end up being uptaken in, in splenic leukocytes, and you decrease the amount that uh, end up being uptaken by B cells in the spleen. And we think that this might drive, the, that this, this might be the reason why uh, in, in the end you have a much uh, lower immune response that is directed against BEG when you when you remove the complement. So this here is the using the cobra venom factor, but these, re, re, um, these results were also obtained using uh, transgenic models that do not express C3. So this is what happens when you have nanoparticles that are injected intravenously. But very interestingly, what Philip has shown is, is, is that when you do the same experiment, but in animals where instead, so you, you either uh, you test the immunogenicity of nanoparticles in animals that have the ability to uh, activate the complement or that haven't the, uh, that do not have the ability to activate complement because they received cobra venom factor before and you inject the nanoparticles instead of being injected intravenously you inject them sub q what sorry i moved the backwards but so what you see is that the immune response is almost is very similar in both animals in other way in other words Removing the complement in that context, when the nanoparticles are injected sub-Q, does not change the immune response. It does change a little bit the amount of nanoparticles that reach up the spleen to the spleen. So you can see that there is a difference, like we've seen in the, prior, the previous slide, 
there is a difference in the in the amount of of uh, nanoparticles that are uptaken by B cells in the spleen, but this is not true in the B cells of the lymph node. And what and what we think is that the lymph node, in that sense, because they are the immediate the the first tissue that that these nanoparticles distribute to when the, when the, the nanoparticles are distribute are injected uh, subcutaneously, um, they are involved in the immune response. So. Uh, for us, it, it was this work was really interesting because uh, it shows that, uh, so again, the protein corona is important for the pharmacology of the drug, uh, and that shows it, you know, this, this is shown in vivo, but uh, it also shows that the same material based on how you inject it, right, whether you inject it intravenously or if you inject it subcutaneously, uh, it truly engages the immune system very, very differently, right? So, um, so... So for us, it, it it was it was interesting, and it was a demonstration that the uh, you know the um, the importance of of the injection route is 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 truly uh, very important when you try to decipher what nanoparticles do. Um, but obviously, the 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 issue with this this work is that this work was conducted in mice, and mice are not humans, right? So uh, we were interested to find out what happens in humans, and uh, and see you know what when. Uh, yeah, what happens in human and is the anti-peg immune response truly a problem? Um, for example, when we uh, vaccinate with mRNA vaccines. So back in April 2001, uh, before these other papers that I talked about were published, um, we sort of did a, a small clinical trials where we uh, recruited the healthy volunteers and we uh, conducted this study. Right. So we uh, took a blood sample for from these uh, from these participants um, before vaccination. And we call this blood sample baseline. Then we waited you know, around four to, you know, four to five weeks after the first dose of vaccination, and then we uh, collected the second blood samples. Um, back in two thousand one, in two thousand one, twenty in twenty twenty one, we thought that uh, people would only require two doses of vaccine. Maybe we were naive in that way, but uh, so the. The clinical uh, study was only conducted for two doses of vaccines. After the second dose, we also collected some blood, which was um, more three to four months months after the second dose, right? And we uh, so from this blood, we used the um, serum and the plasma. Uh, we biobanked it, and then we also uh, looked at the B, at the B cells. Uh, sorry, at the uh, at peripheral blood mono, uh, monocytic cells. Um, but we haven't looked. Yeah, so. We have these in our biobanks right now. So this is uh, our participants. So we were able to recruit uh, approximately 83 volunteers, uh, a relatively young population, 30 years of age uh, approximately, which was uh, uh, really young because we recruited uh, you know, within our research center here and within the university. So we mostly attracted uh, students. Uh, most of the people that were uh, recruited in our, our clinical trial were women. Um, this is the age distribution. So as you can see, they were pretty old. We were not allowed to recruit uh, minors. So, you know, the youngest participant were uh, 18 years old. Um, so the population that we have is extremely homogeneous. So, uh, so uh, it's extremely homogeneous. Uh, it's quite educated. The population is quite educated, again, because we recruited within the university. Um, and most of them were vaccinated with uh, Pfizer's technology. Uh, so, yeah, and, and one thing that is uh, important to notice is that, you know, like the baseline sample that I was talking about was roughly around five days before vaccination. And the second one was roughly 30 days after the first dose. And the second, uh, I mean, uh, the sample after the second dose was roughly after 100 days after the second dose. The method we use to quantify these antibodies differs a little bit from the uh, reports that are, uh, you know, published elsewhere in a way that we did use an ELISA, but what we did in this ELISA, we sort of uh, added a, diff a second step where we also, for the same experiment, uh, though for the same sample, we measured it within a competition condition where we were competing the response with um, some pegylated nanoparticles that could scavenge the PEG-specific antibodies. And for us, that was important in order to get rid of anything binding the bottom of the plate that would be non-specific for PEG. And therefore, the anti-PEG signal with this design of, of uh, two, ELISA, two uh, uh, parallel ELISA on a single sample allowed us to determine the anti-PEG uh, 
immune response more specifically than if we would just have done this one. So these are the results. And basically you can see the results here at baseline. So at the baseline, our 83 participants had, had um, you know, different levels of IgGs and IgM that could recognize PEG. And some of them had very high levels and others had very low levels, right? After the first dose, you can see uh, two different things. You can see that some patient have decreases in the in the levels of anti-PEG antibodies that that are that can be observed in their blood, but also some individuals have increases in the the amount of anti-PEG antibodies that that uh, are detectable, right? Um, and this is true after the first dose. This is also true after the second dose. So in general, I think that uh, you know this data confirms the the, the data that was reported by others before in the way that. Uh, mRNA vaccines seem to drive an anti-PEG immune response. So they seem to increase the, the levels of in some people, but not all people, right? Um, and now I think we need to pursue that a little bit further and try to understand, you know, what differentiates the people that do re strongly react or more strongly react to these um, to these vaccines uh, than, you know, from people that do not react. Is it because, you know, for example, you have a bunch here that do not react at all. They had no uh, basal levels and then, you know, no levels even after two doses. And you have some people that had high baseline levels and then, you know, even after do two doses, they have, you know, uh, either unchanged levels of anti-PEG antibodies or levels that were slightly decreased. In some uh, instances here, uh, you know, this is missing data. I did not uh, emphasize this too much, but we lost some patients uh, along the way just because they decided not to come back to our study, not because they died, to be clear, <laughs> right? So, um, but, uh, you know, what we can do is is looking at the people that that more strongly reacted, we can we can see something, right? So on the on the one hand, you can see that it's mostly women that react, but but again, this is not very surprising because our population is, is also, you know, 63% uh, women. So, so this is not very surprising, but I think what, what is the most interesting and that confirms also what people have shown in other studies is that the Moderna vaccine seem to be a bit more immunogenic than the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, so here it doesn't show like this way, but, but, uh, but if you remember the results I showed most of our population, and in fact, 90% of our participants were vaccinated with Pfizer vaccine. Yet, if you look only at the participant that had changes in, in, their, uh, in their levels of anti-PEG antibodies, you can see that uh, here, uh, people that received Moderna were more uh, strongly represented than in our baseline population in the night. So here you have 30% of the people that, that you know, had immune reactions that received Moderna. So again, you know, this is indirect uh, measurement. We didn't have the uh, statistical power to really show that there's a huge differences between the two vaccines, but this this probably offers some evidence that uh, Moderna vaccines is probably a bit more immunogenic. So, so this these are the the primary conclusions of of the uh, the uh, the clinical studies. So, you know, the levels that we've seen in our population are comparable to the levels that have been observed before. Um, Vaccination with PEG-containing mRNA vaccines seem to drive a increase in IgG, anti-PEG IgG, maybe an increase in anti-PEG IgM. Um, but you know, we don't know if that matters really or if it's just something that happens, right? The limitation of this study, and I think that we should definitely emphasize it, is that the the number of participants is relatively small. Our population is very homogeneous, and also there's no unvaccinated group. And this is important because we don't know if these fluctuations that we see in individuals are truly due to the vaccines or just to the fact that we have longitudinal samples uh, in patients that, you know, have not, uh, you know, basically that due to environmental expo exposure, you know, they could have uh, changes in the anti-PEG levels, which are not necessarily related to the mRNA vaccines. So again, uh, we will pursue that in the future. So in general, I think this is the the overall gen the conclusion of the of the presentation. Uh, you know, I think that we can all agree uh, between you know aficionados of nanomedicine that uh, you know the interactions of nanomedicines with the biological systems are relatively complex. That you know, I think we need you know further studies to elucidate all the different mechanisms by which nanoparticles can engage different 
functions of the human uh, body. In in this case here, we're focused on the immune system, and and we uh, we we hope to be able to uh, you know tell you a little bit more about the clinical relevance of these anti peg uh, antibodies uh, in patients in in the, the near future. So with that, I want to acknowledge the funding. Obviously, um, the the students. So Philippe Grenier uh, did the studies on the mice that I talked about, um, and Valérie, uh, who's a, a research assistant in my lab. Uh, she uh, so Philippe is here in the tree, and Valérie she's here. This is an old picture, by the way. But and also I have Etche and Lucia who are not on the picture, but who are involved now in characterizing uh, Etche. She's characterizing uh, further questions that are interesting in mice and Lucia, she's looking at what happens in the, the clinical samples that we have. So, and I want to, you know, thank Enmin for the support, the ability to speak with you today. And, uh, and you know, I think that we are really privileged to be part of this network as, as the network nears its end, we, we should definitely acknowledge that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bertrand. That's uh, really been a wonderful talk. <clears throat> I'm pleased now to open the floor to questions from participants. So uh, everyone is presently on mute. So to ask a question or to join a discussion, please use your control panel to either raise your hand or to submit a written question. There are a, a couple of questions and comments from Dr. Marcel Bally in the Q&A area, but uh, Dr. Bally, I can uh, allow you to talk, as I've just done. If you wish to speak, just unmute yourself, and you can articulate these questions directly. Otherwise, I'll read them out. I'm not very surprised about, you know, I had some discussion with Marcel about that, so I'm not very surprised about the comments, but I can read them, right? So I will I will use Marcel's voice to do that. Yeah. No, I don't think I can. <laughs> Unfortunately. So two points, two points from me. First, I tell my students that they should not assume that PEG lipids are needed unless they are, there is a defined role. The roles that I consider is low dose liposomes given IV and for formulation where liposomes, LNPs self aggregate. Uh, yeah. Second, I'm always thinking that the PEG issue is related to the proteins that have bound the PEG form to the big formulation. The protein binding is influenced by other factors, for example, liposomal lipid composition. So that means that the use of PEG may be concerning in some situation, but not in others. Sorry, long question. I mean, to be fair, there's no question yet, Marcel. The yeah. PEG lipids yeah. being used are varied uh, and not all the same. Some PEG lipids carry negative charges, other do not. Uh, thank you for mentioning the protein corona. When there is an immune reaction to liposomes, the change in plasma elimination is dramatic, sort of all or none reaction makes me think that some of the PEG immune effects are more subtle. Hence, as you explained, the immune response can be dramatic or, or subtle. If you mention the difference between mice and humans, but this can also be difference between mice and rats or rodents or pigs, and, and this creates a developmental headache. Um, I think that, I think it's 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 absolutely true. All, all that you said is, is true. Um, the results that I presented here in animals, they are uh, results that have been obtained with PLGA PEG nanoparticles. So it's not even a PEG lipid here. It's a polymer with, where PEG is covalently attached to a biodegradable polymer. So again, uh, everything that you said is, is true, but I think that, the, that, that, that it certainly does matter that the, um, you know, the, the type of, the way that the PEG is tethered will matter. And then, as you mentioned, the SP peg is negatively charged. The MG peg is neutral. So you know, like the charges will be important, and more importantly, also I mean, the charges, but also with mRNA vaccines, the peg lipid is shed, right? So it doesn't stay on the nanoparticles, and yet it we can see that it seems to be immunogenic in some circumstances. If we can, if we can draw these conclusions, um, so I think that you you you're totally right that it is very complex. And I think that we need to, uh, you know, I mean, so this is my opinion, but I think we need to figure out a way that we can understand what happens and then see if what happens is important for our own formulation or if it's not. And, and, and I think that most importantly, if it's true that patients or everybody that has been vaccinated with mRNA vaccines has now or 
you know, maybe not everybody, but some portion of, of the people that have been vaccinated have some circulating levels of uh, anti-PEG IgM or IgGs, does it matter for what we do, right? And and to your point, I think that I agree that with liposomes, you don't need the PEG at all, right? Um, but, or, I mean, depending again, what, but, um, but again, you know, like with polymer nanoparticles, it's much easier to use the PEG. And if you don't use the PEG, you face a lot of different problems that are not. So I think that it depends on your system. And I think that we, uh, you know, it's, it is probably important to, to figure it out. Um, there is a technical question. What's the meaning of the unit of IgM in unit per microliter? Um, so this is a relevant question. The kit that we buy is a polyclonal. So the standard that we use for calibration of the kit is a polyclonal IgM that is provided by the company. And it's not pure. Um, so this is for the kit in mice. Uh, now what we use in uh, human, it's different. These are absolute units in microgram because we have a standard, which is a monoclonal anti-PEG antibody. Um, but in the case of the kit that we use for mice, at least in the beginning, uh, it is a unit that is provided by the company because it is not pure IgM. Not all IgM bind uh, strictly PEG in that uh, in this standard, and it's uh, polyclonal, right? So this is there. The other question comes from Sarthak Garg. Um, I was wondering how significant the effect of time between sensitization and the second dose is in immune response and clearance. I think this is a very relevant question. I think that the uh, IgM response is transient, although in our hands, in the studies that we've done, I, I'm not showing this, but we can see that all the way until four weeks after a first injection, we can still see anti-PEG IgM in the serum of the animals. And so it, it is possible that this effect could remain as long as, as uh, four weeks, although we haven't tested to see from the pharmacokinetic perspective, it does change, um, but it is a very relevant question. Uh, you know, is it, does it, you know, in humans, does it stay very long or is it very transient? And then afterwards it decreases. What clinical studies have seen, have shown, is that the levels of antibodies seem to be uh, important in a certain way because the highest, the higher the levels of antibody you have, the more the neutralizing effect are, which makes sense. And um, and of course, the dose of the, the drug that you're dosing is also important. Another question uh, from my friend Eliana from Brazil. Um, have you looked at the difference in pro Iliana Lima? Um, have you looked at the difference in protein corona and nanoparticles following IV and sub Q administration? Could that have a role in the distribution and immune system interactions with the particles, so, such as capture with bidendritic cells, transport to lymph nodes, spleen, and liver accumulation? So we have not looked at the protein corona on nanoparticles after both administration route. This is something that that is of interest to us. Um, but uh, but I but but it is tricky to look into it, and because most of the dose does, I guess it depends the type of sub Q injection. But in in some sub some types of sub Q injection, the blood exposure of the nanoparticles remains relatively low. Um, we talk a little bit about it in the paper that was published last year by Philip. Uh, but no, we haven't looked into it, and I think that you, I totally agree with you that these interaction with the protein corona could definitely alter how the nanoparticles engage the immune system. So, Dr. sorry to interrupt, Dr. Bally has his hand raised. Uh, you're unmuted on my end, uh, Marcel, okay. if you want to speak, go ahead. I, I hope people can hear, and I'm going to try doing this as a question as opposed to a comment. <laughs> Uh, well, the question really had to do with something, Nicholas, uh, you, you said about the difference between a pegylated liposome and a pegylated particle. And one of the things that we grappled with was the idea that PEG in a lipid um, environment is mobile versus PEG attached onto a solid surface is fixed. So the question is, do you think there's gonna be a difference in the way the immune system reacts 
in the context of mobile peg versus stationary peg? So uh, I think it's it's a it's a very good question, and I'm sorry, uh, Marcel, I I did not mean to say that you did not ask a question, but uh, but yeah, it's a very relevant question. In fact, I can tell you that our empirical evidence show that there are differences in the yeah. mechanisms. It's not uh, yet ripe for presentation the results that we have in liposomes, but uh, with liposomes with peg elite liposomes, and again. DSP peg liposomes. So, uh, so it's, a, it's you know, as you know, there are many ways to pegulate a liposome. So, um, but yes, I agree. I don't know if it's due to the mobility of the peg. Um, one of the, so at least for our polymer nanoparticles, when we calculated the density of the peg that was on these nanoparticles, the peg were in the, uh, what's so-called brush conformation, right? Which you you must know. Uh, uh, and so that is very dense peg conformation. And there is not a lot of, so I would think that there's not a lot of side-to-side of, um, -side mobility in that case because the polymer, you know, they sort of have a steric effect. Each polymer chain has a steric effect on the other one next to it. So. And I don't know if the peg lipids that and you know the peg lipid liposomes that we use if they are on in the brush conformation or in well, the other conformation which is the mushroom, but but I don't know. Well, yeah. that's, uh, my my point was really the the idea of brush versus mushroom doesn't necessarily work in the context of a lipid environment where you have proteins bind, which cause lateral phase separation of your pegylated lipids. Yeah, may start with a more random distribution, but you may end up with a more uh, localized, dense distribution of the peg lipid on the surface of life. And that's going to influence protein binding and all sorts of other things. So it really is a complicated question. I, I think so. I think so. And 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 I think that there is a very a, a strong biophysical component to it, which yeah. which is uh, probably above my pay grade. But, uh, but uh, what I would say is that, uh, you know, we will try to solve this in in terms of you know demonstration comparing different systems and see if if we can uh if we observe different things under the same conditions using you know polymer nanoparticles and and, and liposomes and i can tell you that in some instances we do see very different things but we need to confirm that so before i maybe next time I, we can we can i can tell, tell you more about it thanks thank you so much Thanks, Nicholas. Um, what I was going to say was that, um, so we've compared the immune response from uh, two different types of controls. The first type of control is a, um, a, a pegylated lipid nanoparticle that contains an ionizable lipid as well as a negative counter ion. And then we've compared that and, and we found an immunogenic response from that. And then we compared that with a lipid nanoparticle that was pegylated and it contained a random control microRNA that would condense with the ionizable um, lipid nanoparticle. And we saw less immunogenic response from the random uh, sequence microRNA control as compared with the one that didn't have microRNA in it, but it had the the lipid. So it was like a liposome with, with extra salt, kind of, right? It wasn't a very clever experiment, but we sort of thought that 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 um the first wouldn't be so immunogenic, but it was there was a difference and it was smaller for the one that had the nucleic acid. So I'm sitting there and I'm wondering to myself, like, imagine you were to do this in another patient study, what would be the right control or the right experiment with right type of lipid, nan lipid nanoparticle if you're trying to do a, a gene therapy because there's so many different gene therapies in the business that are coming up and i don't actually see in the literature that i've seen too much paying attention to this so because you're you're you know unusually ex expert at this what do you think would be the proper control particle for a gene therapy that had a pegylated um lipid so I think that this, if you want to look at it clinically, I think that you need to use the formulation which is relevant, right? And then, as you mentioned, depending on the characteristic of your formulation, it always going to depend. From the regulatory perspective, it is something that people that the regulatory agencies ask 
when the peg is covalently attached to a protein. So there are some FDA guidelines, for example, on peg immunogenicity when you have a pegylated protein. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not aware that specific guidelines exist for pegylated nanomedicines. Um, and doing control experiments in 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 um, in humans is is difficult because you, you but but I think in in my clinical trial what I would like to have is samples and and you know I think it's just a matter of accessing them from biobanks but samples way be way before you know uh, mRNA vaccination where you you had longitudinal sam longitudinal samples of patients. And then look at, you know, does that change? Because it is possible that you and I, even if we remove the mRNA vaccines, our levels change, you know, due to maybe someday we shave, someday we don't. And then, you know, we get exposure that 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 differentiates, right? So I think that, uh, you know, samples before the fact or a population before you treat, if you could have, you know, say, three months of each individual patient that you enroll in your clinical trial and you have longitudinal samples, then you can, you know, continue sampling them and see, you know, do I see a change? I think this right. is one way of doing it. Uh, in the case of the COVID, I mean, so we had to, to act very quickly when we started this clinical trial and it was the first time we did it. So we, you know, like looking back, I would do things differently for sure. But, um, but you know, looking at people that had been vaccinated, for example, with the AstraZeneca technology when it was available in Canada, would also have been interesting. In that technology, there are there is some polysorbate, right? Which is which is also pegylated. So again, it's not the perfect control, but but then since peg is is everywhere, so I'm not sure I have the 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 right answer. I think that's why animal models are interesting. Once this is at least my opinion, when when once we understand the mechanisms by which one system drives the immune response, then maybe we can you know, once it's been screened and sort of understood, then we can use different technologies and see, do they engage the same mechanisms or do they engage different ones? And I think that that could be part of the answer, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I should have mentioned that that was in a, in a, in a mouse model, but what I talked about. Um, but I agree with you. There's a lot of stuff to unpack here. Uh, there are also data in some of the regulatory documents. So if you look at the European documents uh, under the regulatory approval of on Patro, there is some interesting information there, yep. uh, which is of course pre-COVID. Um, so, but it's not extensive. Uh, so, so uh, I really, really, uh, I really appreciate your seminar because it, it points out this issue that I think um, is is valuable for us to to pay attention to. But unfortunately, I must say we've come to the end of our time for today's lecture, and I'm really sorry about that because I think there could be a long discussion here, and maybe it will occur offline. So I'd like to invite attendees to please join me in thanking Dr. Nicholas Bertrand for delivering the March 2024 Enmin Lecture.